Okay. To Great. That. Yes. Right on. Well, look, I want to welcome everybody to the 1776 Syndicate. Thank you for being here tonight. And for those of you that listen to uh, this message later on, we appreciate you as well. I know that we are right in the heat of election season. We've got a few weeks out from the generals. And, uh, you know, we were very fortunate to be at the Lincoln Reagan Trump dinner the other night here in Flathead County. We had some wonderful guest speakers. But the overarching message that we heard was, you know, things could there's a little bit of hope out there, but we really, really have to get people out to vote. Yeah, you know, obviously, if you're on this call, you're probably organized and involved. But if you're not, get your friends out to vote and get your friends friends out to vote. You know, we can't take for granted that there's going to be the red wave that we hear in the news. And by the way, the left is going to do everything they can to keep that red wave from happening. So the masses are what's going to curb uh, those computer systems and the corruption within our system. So get out there. Let's all be a part of that. All right. Well, look, you know, the 1776 was started to help people run for office. And we've had a, a number of people that that won their primaries. And we've got a lot that have, are part of the general. So we look forward to seeing those outcomes. But if you're aspiring to run for office in the future, whether that's 2023, maybe there's a school board spot or local election. And then beyond that, looking at 2024, you can't start soon enough to begin educating yourself, getting involved at different levels and start working your campaign. And one of the things about the syndicate is if you're a member on the back end of our website, we've got some great materials that you can use as resources, whether that's a campaign guide, a budget guide, people that you can reach out to, marketing assistance, and the list goes on. Not to mention you have a huge library, almost 12 months of uh, special guests across the board from elected officials uh, to speakers on the Green New Deal and the dangers of that and everything in between. So, and tonight's going to be no different than that. We're bringing a great resource on and I'm going to read uh, the bio here of our special guest and that's Arthur Shaper, who I met really. Oh gosh, I should have made that correction right away. Uh, Shopper. That's Shopper. my last name. Arthur, I apologize for that. Um, you know, I was made aware of you through John Fuller, our, our state legislator here in Kalispell, based on a case that he was reading about. But I want to read your bio, and then I'm going to open up the floor for you to tell your story and what you do and tell us more about mass resistance. So Arthur's the field director for mass resistance, the international pro-family anti-LGBT activist organization that makes the difference. Under Arthur's leadership, mass resistance chapters have opened in Ohio, Texas, New York, Canada, Hong Kong, and elsewhere around the world. Since 2004, Arthur has been a committed pro-family activist fighting the LGBT agenda and the lies it's based upon. With his help and working with an incredible group of activists around the United States and the world, mass resistance has shut down drag queen story hour programs remove perverted sex ed programs from public schools and stop bad legislation like bans on life-saving reparative therapy. Before his work with mass resistance, Arthur was a freelance writer and activist fighting for a number of issues, including the pro-family fight to stop the spread of LGBT agenda in the United States and around the world. Born, raised, and still living in Torrance, California, Arthur is committed to protecting family, faith, and freedom in all respects. And uh, Arthur's pit posted up the link there and uh, please pay attention to the notes because there's going to be a number of links popping up and references. And then by the way, on the back end of 1776, we'll have some more links for you to click into as we go through the story. And Arthur, I love, I don't love that you're in California, but uh, I am familiar with your hometown there and uh, kind of what the, the surrounding area looks like. And you are right in the thick of everything. So yes. uh, Appreciate you being on the show tonight. I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, would love to hear more about yourself and what you're doing with Mass Resistance. Thanks so much, Jim, for having me. And I want to thank the rest of the 1776 Syndicate for allowing me to speak with you today. Uh, the, the LGBT agenda is quite a contentious subject. Even now, I am glad to see in a number of contentious uh, U.S. Senate and House and even governor's races, this issue is coming up again because of the repeal of Roe versus Wade, because God bless Justice Thomas, he is ready to right another historical wrong 
by our overreaching Supreme Court, which normalized. I don't call it gay marriage. I call it false marriage. Two men cannot be married. I don't care how many bad lawyers in black dresses declared otherwise. This is an issue, however, I find that elected officials or candidates still don't want to talk about or that they feel reticent to speak about forcefully. Where mass resistance, we've been fighting this agenda for nearly 30 years, starting in 1993, and I'll start getting into that briefly. But before I segue further, I provided a link right away in the chat, and I'd like Jim to share that with the audience, uh, just to give a brief window into the impact that our organization has had. And you may already know about it uh, without our saying anything further. Do you see the link there, Jim? Okay, go ahead and click on it so that they can see the, just to see that article. I gotta, do, I gotta do a share screen real quick there. Sure. It just occurred to me, this would be a great way to start everything. Okay, please start sharing now. There we go. Excellent. So how many of you recall how in Houston, Texas, there was a drag queen story hour program where not one, but two of the drag queens were exposed as sex offenders? How many of you may have heard of that? <laughs> All right. That was mass resistance. That was our effort, specifically Tracy Shannon right there. She's wearing the she's holding the purple sign. She and her colleagues, they did the work that the local press and certainly the library failed to do, which was to do a basic background check. Of course, we have now seen, our organization has uncovered in many drag queen programs, these perverted men dressed up as garish parodies of women. They have, they work in the sex trafficking industry, prostitution. Many of them have previous criminal offenses, criminal records with uh, threatening, uh, you know, attempted murder, prostitution and other sex crimes. You know, of course, this is the most heinous, an adult molesting a child. So mass resistance exposed that. We were not afraid to have that very difficult discussion pointing out that this whole LGBT agenda, it's saturated with child predation, child abuse, and, and the like. We have to have the courage to speak on these issues. But now let me get to my script of sorts. So to, tonight, I am privileged to be able to talk about our organization, who we are, why we need to care about fighting this LGBT agenda, whereas, as I just mentioned, a lot of politicos want to kind of avoid it. I wanna talk about how to talk about this issue because I understand that candidates and even elect, current elected officials are going to be watching this program. How to deal with this, how to approach, approach this issue with fellow conservatives, family, et cetera. I wanna talk about the pro-family victories we have and we've already uh, achieved, what we need to do to fight this perversion. And I wanna talk specifically about what mass resistance has done in Montana. All right, so who is mass resistance? So just to, just to repeat, my name is Arthur. I'm the field director. Uh, we are the we are an international group. Uh, for over 25 years, we've been fighting this culture of death, this destructive LGBT agenda. Our efforts began in the public schools, specifically in Newton, Massachusetts. Brian Kamenker, he's the president of Mass Resistance. He, as a parent at the time, this was in 93, he noticed the awful material that his children were receiving in the public schools. Uh, you know, sex ed related, absolutely perverse stuff. He and a group of parents organized to push back on the school district to end this perverse curriculum. Later on, they were able to mobilize parents statewide and they forced passage of a law, an opt-out law, so that kids would not have to participate in the sex ed curriculum. Remember, this is deep blue Massachusetts. It was blue even in 1993. Mass Resistance, we're a unique organization because we are an in-your-face confrontational pro-family group. We do not shy away from speaking the truth about the destructive homosexual and transgender agendas, as well as the connections with the Black Lives Matter and critical race theory, or rather racist theory garbage that's being pushed in schools per currently. It is important for me to stress with all of you that the whole agenda is suffused in many school curricula now. So. Why is this fight against the LGBT agenda so important, okay? The first question many conservatives often get from fellow conservatives, where we've seen a libertarian temptation start to become very pervasive, 
And I know that's particularly the case in mountain states like Montana, Idaho, and especially Wyoming. The question we often get posed, well, who cares what two consenting adults do in their bedrooms? It doesn't affect me or you, so why should we care? Well, the fact of the matter is, especially now, we recognize that private behavior has public consequences. Yes, sexual conduct is a private act, but its consequences do not stay in the bedroom. We have seen this LGBT movement go from normalizing a perversion in the bedroom to invading the boardroom and now indoctrinating in the classroom. And now it's coming to our rooms where we don't have room to be citizens enjoying our own natural rights. This is an agenda that affects all of us. And even at the very at the very tip of the spear, the federal government spends $35 billion alone on AIDS treatments alone. Right away, there's a financial burden that impacts all of us. And of course, there's an encroaching tyranny. Homosexual activists have announced from the beginning that they were not content just to be free from penalty. They want their behaviors to be seen as normal and healthy by everybody else. Of course, the behaviors are not healthy. They are not normative. Uh, and I'll be talking later about research that our organization has done. I will never forget, I, I, as I mentioned, I live in Torrance, California. In Hermosa Beach, California, I was at a town hall for our congressman. And a gay activist got in my face and plainly said, you have to accept me. I will not accept tolerance. Of course, he didn't understand the meaning of acceptance or tolerance, but that is the mantra, basically, of this whole LGBT movement. And we see this kind of abuse manifest in gay pride parades, where it has become very clear that they not only celebrate their behavior, but they expect you to accept it. And this degeneracy is degrading the public square and it harms our children. These destructive behaviors are now required instruction in a growing number of states, and parents are not allowed to opt their children out of the learning. I also want to give a brief history lesson on how pervasive and destructive this LGBT nonsense has become. We can go back to 20 years ago when a pastor in Sweden named Oka Green was, was sent to jail simply for preaching against all sexual perversions, including homosexuality. Now, he was ultimately acquitted, but the legal persecution began as far back as then. And this is in the Western world. We can fast forward to 2015. Dr. Paul Church of Boston at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, he lost his job as a urologist simply because he told his gay patients the truth about the harms, the inherent harms of their sexual behaviors. We can talk about how today in Canada, Bill Watcott, he is a Christian evangelist, big supporter of mass resistance. He was arrested in Toronto for passing out gospel tracts at a gay pride parade. He, is, he also faces multiple fines from different tribunals. There are human rights tribunals in Canada, which of course do not defend human rights. What was Bill Watcott's crime? He called the biological male a man. That's in Canada. Of course, we see similar persecutions here in the United States. Jack Phillips, we all know about him, the cake, uh, the uh, the baker and cake maker in Colorado, and also the uh, the bake uh, the bakery owners in Oregon, Aaron and Melissa Klein, faced rigorous persecution, and they are still facing litigation to this day in Oregon. Although I am now aware that Aaron and Melissa Klein, they now live in Montana, uh, but they still face legal persecution because they wouldn't bake the cake. I could also talk about Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez, who was a professor at Cal State Northridge in the late 2000s. He was forced out of his job because he defended natural marriage and was not afraid to speak the truth about the abuse and the lack he faced as a child raised in a two lesbian home. In California, where I live, it's even a misdemeanor now to, it's only a misdemeanor to knowingly infect somebody with AIDS. And you can also face up to a year in jail if you misgender someone in a nursing home. Ch children are now subjected to perverted men dressed up as garish parodies of women, drag queens, who indoctrinate their false ideas about gender fluidity and so-called queer role models. Based on the statistics and outcomes alone associated with homosexuality and transgenderism, it is clear that LGBT behaviors are nothing to model. And of course, 
this was just two years ago. How many of you remember the perverted gay men's chorus singing, will convert your children? They were not joking. They were telling the truth. And a number of them have been exposed as registered sex offenders too, okay? On a broader level, a strong and stable society requires families. That's a one man and one woman raising and rearing children. The very tenets of economic and political freedom cannot survive without families and families who impart these values and training to their very children. You can read the historical accounts of Polybius, an ancient Greco-Roman historian. He was an eyewitness to the implosion of the Greco-Roman city-states because of the breakdown of the family. Fast forward to today, and we see this same civilizational breakdown in New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, and it's inching its way towards every other community in our country and around the world. This LGBT agenda does very much affect us. What happens in private has public consequences. What happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas. Now, the interest I have in speaking with you and the 1770 syndicate as a whole is how do we talk about this issue with fellow conservatives? Because really, this is the first line of attack. We find that even conservatives by and large are shying away from this issue or they wanna give up on fighting for natural marriage, life and family. So I wanna share with you a few years ago, a friend of mine in San Pedro, California invited me to a special dinner with a small group of other friends. We were talking about the 2020 election, Congress, et cetera. And then the hostess brought up the issue of homosexuality as a point of discussion. Part of the reason is because they know about my work with mass resistance. And that pretty much right away set the tone. The people there uh, were, um, the, the way that they responded to that question pretty much says it all. The first guy had acknowledged, well, you know, was very uncomfortable and said, well, let's talk about something else. One lady at the table, a friend of mine, suggested that um, there is indeed a small segment of the population that is born that way. Another person at the table suggested that different hormonal developments in an individual cause people to have a different sexual orientation. But what struck me about many of the, of the individuals in this discussion is that they had generated their views on this issue based only on personal experience. They had friends or relatives who were gay. Another lady who helps our organization shared concern about fighting this agenda because her son, he is married and has a child, he is pro-gay and she is worried about losing relationships with her son and her grandson. Someone recently, someone, um, and someone even recently asked me about how to address this issue in more polite or sympathetic company. The fact is nobody wants to be shut down or labeled anti-gay, homophobic, or transphobic. And the first thing to engage in these situations should be, are you talking? Are you willing to? Are you talking to someone who's willing to listen, or are you dealing with an activist or a leftist who is not interested in a discussion but is just interested in shutting down dissent? Again, if we're in a generally conservative milieu, we hopefully have an audience that's willing to listen. Once that's settled, you just have to speak the truth, but speak it calmly. No matter what happens. The PC cult, which has, which has silenced conservatives on so many issues, um, has done so in the most tyrannical way, but we should not be afraid of that. People really think that if you speak out against this agenda, it means you hate people. But here's often the, the uh, this is the analogy I respond, I use to respond to that charge. If you have a loved one and that person is dying of cancer, you're going to hate that cancer because it's killing the person you love homosexuality and transgenderism. These are disorderly forms of conduct. They're a cancer, they are killing people. Homosexual conduct, it cuts the lifespan short by an average of 20% of each individual who engages in the behaviors. That is not, um, that's not a form of love. It's, a, it's not healthy, it's not normal. And even the homosexuals themselves, they know it. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos was well known as an outspoken you know, libertarian leaning conservative with Breitbart, he now has his own, uh, he now has different kinds of enterprises, but he could not at, but acknowledge the fact that homosexuality is inherently destructive. He talked about this at Boston's first annual straight pride parade in 2018, straight pride. They had a, they had a pride parade for straight people or spoke, speaking up for 
natural marriage life and family. It it had a considerable audience that that attended. The Boston police had to show up in large numbers in order to defend everybody. Milo is now an ex-gay, and he's a big supporter of mass resistance, by the way. But we have to acknowledge the gay lifestyle and the culture itself is destructive. Uh, here's a here's a testimony I'd like to share with you from a former homosexual raised by two lesbians who had entered into the gay les lifestyle himself. These are his test. These are his words. Gay culture is a culture of abuse. At its core lies a carefully crafted falsehood. You are born this way. Pure and simple, that is a pickup line. This seduction worms into the psyche of vulnerable and targeted children. This way, when predators lure them into bed, the luring feeling feels like the caress of a liberator rather than the harms of a rapist. In the after Aftermath, you live with doubt and fear that the rapist was right. You start to believe that it was something inside you that asked for it, while anyone who points out to, to you that your experience was abusive is now cast as an oppressor. The account, that account alone is enough for me to for me to keep speaking out against this agenda. And there are millions of people out there who have been harmed, abused, neglected, molested, raped. Such trauma damages a person's person's self-concept, undermines the truth about who they really are. And the last thing that we should do if we really care about love is to enable this to enable this dysfunction. So here's the thing. We need to start having this discussion as a culture, a robust debate about the origins and consequences of homosexuality and transgenderism in the mainstream. Sorry about that. I lost my place briefly here. Um, I submit to you that the reason why, uh, the, when we uh, when we explain the the basis about this issue, we can expose how it's a total fraud. The truth is that that no one is born gay. Study upon study have confirmed that there is no genetic element to homosexuality. From a logical perspective, it makes no sense that people are born that way to begin with. Procreation is essential to the transmission of genetic data, character traits, etc. Homosexuals, as a rule, do not reproduce. How can the trait be genetic? Nature.com, in fact, released um, a final study about this in 2019. A longitudinal study confirmed that among 500,000 individuals tracked over time, there was no genetic homo component to homosexuality. I'd also like to share a report from LA Weekly, a very liberal newspaper. 43 years after the Stonewall riots in New York City, gay men still struggle with high rates of drug, sex, and alcohol-related problems. This is a situation that gay leaders are hesitant to discuss openly for fear that so-called anti-gay factions will use these facts to promote, the, pr pr to promote the bigoted view that men are sick and disturbed. Well, the fact is that these behaviors are, are, are sick and disturbed. That's why these behaviors have been recognized as mental disorders for decades and why civilizations across the board discouraged and even criminalized the conduct. Here are some statistics I'd like to sh share with you. Gay men are two times more likely to have cancer than straight men. The Cancer Network referenced a 60% 60 60 preponderance of anal cancers among homosexuals. The Journal of Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, this is in 2013, confirmed that homosexuals have a higher number of partners and a greater fre frequency of, um, of, of part sexual partners compared to uh, heterosexuals. Uh, Frontiers in Psychology in 2018 reported that there is a higher incidence of domestic violence among homosexuals. The Los Angeles Times reported in 2018 that STDs are skyrocketing in Los Angeles County, and the vast majority of those cases are syphilis, and they afflict gay and bisexual men. So let's wrap up. I'd like to wrap up common retorts that are used that are often uh, a response to people who stand up to the LGBT agenda or who try to normalize the conduct. Animals engage in homosexual behavior. What's wrong with humans doing the same thing? It's important to note that animals also kill their young. They abandon weaker members of their group. Female uh, praying mantises bite off the head of their male partners. Animal behaviors are not a standard for human conduct. Remember, we treat animals humanely. 
we don't treat them like animals, correct? Uh, another retort we often hear. I know gay couples who are happy and who have lived a long time. Those are sad and far removed exceptions from the statistical epide epidemiological fact. The behavior is physically destructive contrary to the very design of human nature and any, any ideology or agenda based on it cannot be conducive to health or happiness. Um, gays and transgender, genders are suffering because of bigoted people fighting against them. Well, the, well, the truth is these, these pathologies afflict LGBT populations in some of the most LGBT affirming states and countries. Psychological per reports and diverse epidemiological studies bear this out time and again. It's not societal pressures and condemnation, but the nature of the very acts themselves that are destructive. Uh, you'll often hear that it's we, we shouldn't say something, we shouldn't say anything mean about LGBT people or, or behaviors. It's wrong to discriminate. But the real problem here is the very meaning of discriminate. Taken at its core, the word simply means to draw a distinction. We need to recognize that there are healthy and unhealthy behaviors. There are wise and unwise choices. There are good ideas and bad ideas. We need to draw these distinctions. And there are clear and there are disorderly distinctions connected with homosexuality and transgenderism. We're not talking about discriminating ab against people based on value neutral or uh, immutable characteristics like skin color or ethnic status. People will even try to misuse the Bible. They'll say, well, Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. But of course, the original Greek in the Bible, it, it speaks about condemn not lest ye be condemned. Telling, the pe telling people the truth is not condemnation, but clarity. It's a form of love. I am not sending anyone to prison or to hell when I tell them the truth, that their behaviors are abhorrent and wrong. In fact, we're saving a life. Okay. Uh, I might as well just... Uh, Skip to another, it, people will often say, you know, they'll, they'll be very abusive. They'll say, well, I don't care. You're a hater. You're just homophobic. Well, on the contrary, anybody who thinks that children should be polluted with this ideology, ideology, they're the ones who are truly hateful. Anyone who supports LGBT does not support love, but rather hates individuals and anybody who is trapped in this lifestyle. Truth be told, the true homophobic is the one who doesn't have the truth to speak out against this agenda. The true transphobe is the person who is so worried about the trans lobby that they won't speak the truth. Last of all, we've been pressured on many other issues across this country in the last two years alone. And even currently, people will say things like, I care about the mask and, the, the mask and vaccine mandates. We need to build a wall on our Southern border. We need to fight against uh, the taxes. We need to fight against the uh, regulatory burdens that are hurting, that are hurting us. Why should we care about this LGBT agenda? The answer is simple: the destruction of the family is the preeminent issue affecting our culture, and it has led to the destructive morass we see today. We need to fight this. This Jude the Judeo-Christian ethic that that made this country great at its outset is collapsing now. We need to bring it back if we are to enjoy our rights on our liberties now that were outlined in the Declaration of Independence. All right, so I've spoken at great length about those issues. I hope that I haven't over, I hope I'm not overstaying my welcome. I understand it's a 25 minute speech that I was offered. I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and for those who will listen to this later on. I want to share with you that Mass Resistance, the organization I work for, we are winning the fight against this agenda. In Downey Unified, which is in, you know, in Downey, California, we worked with parents in 2019, and we were able to get rid of a very bad sex ed curriculum that was, uh, that was created by Planned Parenthood. It took us about six months going door to door, going to school board meetings, but we're, we were able to get the school board to abandon that curriculum. We were even able to get them to abandon those pro LGBT safe zone stickers in their offices and in the school district main office. 
We were relentless and confrontational. We did not ask politely, but we demanded that the school district get rid of the corrupt curriculum. Our activists were clear. We pressed on. We got the press involved. When we went door to door, people knew about what we were doing because they heard about it in the news. I'd also like to share about what happened in Torrance, California, where I live. Uh, city council members reached out to me two years ago about what was happening at a local middle school. Black Lives Matter was being presented to the kids and children who opposed it were bullied and shamed, especially if they wanted to say something as simple as all lives matter. There were teachers pushing BLM and queer related themes onto kids in the classroom as well. A group of us, we went to the school board, we confronted the school board members, we talked to the superintendent. We were able to get an entire Instagram account taken down that one of the schools was promoting, and that included promotions of this Black Lives Matter nonsense. In Anaheim, California, and again, I'm talking about California, we've gotten Planned Parenthood-based sex ed curricula removed from the high schools. We've gotten LGBT programs removed from the elementary schools. And now stepping outside of California, I'm happy to share how we mass resistance and our activists, we have stopped reparative therapy bans from in, in Minnesota, another blue state, but also in Arizona, Nebraska, and Utah. And recently we're happy to share that we have gotten awful explicit books removed from school dist from school districts in Minnesota and Utah and in Idaho. Even in deep blue Massachusetts, we exposed a creepy librarian in Ludlow, Massachusetts, who was socially transitioning students into the opposite sex without the parents' knowledge or permission. We got that librarian to we forced her to resign and the parents are now suing the school district. I'd also like to share with you generally that the pro-family movement is successfully winning from New York City, where they had to repeal reparative therapy bans, to even in countries as far away as Scotland, where gay pride parades have been, have been canceled. Uh, we see at the legislative level and even at the judicial level that terrible laws that have attacked reparative therapy are being repealed. We have more homosexuals who are coming out of the homosexual lifestyle speaking out as well. So when it comes to fighting this agenda, we want to, we, we work with parents and citizens across the board, going to school board meetings, confronting, confronting members outside of the school board. We've been recruiting people to run for office and we've worked with elected officials to fight this agenda in the legislatures as well. We really stress the importance of intellectual activism, fortifying people on how to fight this issue, how to talk about it, the talking points, the issues, uh, the, the, the studies and research we've compiled. Uh, Jim, do you have that link, uh, the health hazards of homosexuality? Would you mind sharing that with the viewers? Sure. While you're talking, uh, I'll pull it up. Thank you so much. Uh, we have compiled a book that has all of the research on the destructive aspects of homosexuality and transgenderism, the mental health issues associated with it. Mass resistance really stresses arguing this issue based on natural law, natural right, and science. We're not focusing on religion or tradition, not that we wanna dismiss religious communities or people who wanna fight for traditional values, but you have to speak the truth about this. You have to show that no people are not born that way. These behaviors have a whole host of health problems associated with them. And like you see with the, you see the picture here from Boston where they have, you know, they've had like, you know, a flagrant promotion of this LGBT nonsense from the governor on down from Republican and Democrat. Even here, we have made the case at the local level, at the state level fighting this stuff and more people are becoming aware of how destructive this agenda is. Uh, Go ahead, Jim, and share some of the stuff we've done in Montana. I gave you two links about some of the stuff we did last year working with legislators. Uh, thanks, everybody. I know I went a little over time. I'm, I'm wrapping this up. Thank you for your patience. So we were, uh, 
we were we were following very closely the two bills one to keep the boys out of gross sports and the other was to uh and uh sex mutilation of minors uh the the bill to keep boys out of gross sports it did pass of course the bill and there's a uh, rep fuller uh we were very familiar with him and other legislators who were working on these efforts uh the amount of backlash we faced two years ago to get rid of sex mutilation of minors was shocking to see so many republicans not just Democrats caving on this issue, falling for a lot of the hollow talking points and lies from big business, big pharma, as well as the big LGBT hate groups was really shocking. And those are some of the, we had some initial successes when uh, Rep Fuller introduced the bill a second time, focusing on surgical mutilation only and not the chemical castration part. But even that bill died in the Senate last year. We are confident and we are working harder with local activists and legislators going into next year. We want to ensure that this behavior is um, banned in the state of Montana. We are also looking at repealing the obscenity exemption, which has allowed libraries and schools to push all kinds of perversion on kids. You have awful books like uh, Gender Queer and This Book is Gay. Those are two notably vile books that we've been able to remove from Idaho schools. And we wanna get that, we wanna get all such filth removed from Montana schools and libraries. We also recognize, just uh, speaking to this story, we do recognize that um, the judiciary is still very hostile in Montana. Uh, we've been uh, following the case of this pastor who we also know runs an independent news site and faced multiple defamation suits. Uh, he did have to file for bankruptcy protection. Uh, we are still following that case. Uh, we are certainly invested and hopeful that the legislature will consider impeaching and removing judges in the next session, if not afterwards, because we see an abusive judiciary that is violating natural right, normalizing all levels of perversion and allowing for such anti-constitutional abuses to ensue. It's mostly these LGBT radicals who are going after the, uh, this is Mr. Jordan Hall is his name, uh, they've been harassing him, the pastor and and and, and uh, media owner. Uh, what I'd like to do now, so you know, to wrap up, so I take any questions from any anybody in the audience. We are very keen on sign, signing people up in Montana. We want to build a movement to go to Helena uh, next year. We know we have a very short window. I'm very familiar with the processes. I know a lot of the legislators. We want to. We have a better idea of which strings to pull. We have the resources to help provide people because at the very least, we want to ensure that we have as many testimonials and witnesses that is comparable to what the LGBT lobby and all of their big business partners bring in. They are, there's a lot of money at stake when it comes to butchering children, for example, and Big Pharma wants to keep that, keep that, that, um, keep that flow of funding. We want to cut this off and stop the abuse of children. Uh, Jim, if you could share the sheet with everybody of how they can sign in or how they can sign up for mass resistance. Uh, I gave you the link in a second email. So our website is massresistance.org. You've seen some of those articles you've seen are from our website. One of our latest successes was in Texas. We exposed another drag queen and got him canceled. Um, if you go to massresistance.org, you can see on the right stand, on the right side of the page, you can click on a link to sign up. You know, this is a chance for you to reach out to us. Uh, we want to build our team throughout the state and not just for the legislature, but we also want to help you with, in your fights with the school board or with the library board or with the local city council. I mean, I'm shocked that Kalispell has a pride parade. I mean, I can't believe this is happening. Even in Torrance, where I live, we don't have pride parades. So, I mean, you see how aggressive this LGBT agenda is. They want to push their way into every red state and try to normalize their perversion. Let's put a stop to this nonsense. I have spoken a little over the time I expected, but I appreciate your patience. I know it threw a lot at you. I talked about mass resistance, what we do, what we're fighting, general ideas, how to fight this agenda, that we equip people and, all right, do you have any questions? I'm here for you now. Well, Arthur, thank, thank you so much. And, and uh, don't worry about the time. I felt like I was drinking from a, a fire hose and, uh, and I'm shaking with anger over what's become of our country and our cities yes. and what has become important in the national news media and so many people's agenda. 
uh, as you're aware, and, and everybody on this call knows that I've fought a little bit of this at the library, and um, it, it really hits close to home. And I've got a laundry list of questions. Uh, I mean, sure. I probably have to have you come on another time. We try to be respectful to our hour. So I'm going to go to Rod so Rod can ask his questions, and uh, we'll get to mine. Maybe, maybe not. But Rod, please go ahead. I know we've got a couple of guests on, too. Wonderful. Thanks. I, um, Arthur, I really appreciate you standing up and stepping up and speaking out yes. um, and educating the rest of us. So uh, that being said, um, I know that hospitals nationwide and even in smaller communities like ours are doing outreaches directly to schools, kind of bypassing the school boards and the parents. And, you know, I know that they're doing this intentionally um, under the guise of health and health care when they are really part of this whole movement. And is mass resistance aware of, of those efforts? And is there something being done to combat that too? It's almost like a sneak attack, um, an end run around, you know, the in your face pride parade and drag mm -hmm. queen story hours. I mean, there's the subversive part scares yes. me just as much. We are very aware of, uh, you know, unscrupulous and corrupted hospital magnates or, you know, you know, healthcare technicians, they, they usually are going through the counselors, you know, they, who take advantage of, you know, at risk youth who are struggling. And so you have these very creepy adults who will say, oh, you're probably transgender. In fact, we exposed, this was a story in Idaho. Let me see if I can find that link. This was a, this got international attention. Um, we had a, can't, we had a, can't, this was in Coeur d'Alene. So, I mean, and Coeur d'Alene is like, uh, not too far from here. It, it, <laughs> right. that the, you know, first of all, and it's like the most conservative part of a very conservative state, you know, and even there you had, this is an elementary school counselor in Coeur d'Alene who, you know, there was a, there was a troubled daughter, a granddaughter comes to, you know, had been, had been telling the school, the principal and the staff, I want to be a boy, call me a boy. And this, she was a very troubled girl. Her father had died in Afghanistan. So, you know, girls who struggle, they have a connection with dad and the dad dies. They start wanting to be males. This is a common pathology that explains what's happened. And so the counselor went along with this and said, okay, you're transsexual. And so we're going to help you tell your mom and your grandma when you go home. And so grandma called me and I said, grandma, call the counselor, get her on the phone, and we're going to record this conversation. Idaho is a one-party consent state, so you can expo you can go Project Veritas on anybody there. And we recorded that conversation. It was absolutely shocking. You have a counselor in an elementary school that is pushing this outrageous nonsense on an 11-year-old who is emotionally troubled. Um, I sent you the link, Jim. Go ahead, and if you want to share that briefly with everybody. So it, it was just, uh, you know, so we, we put that story out. The whole city um, just went up and, you know, th there was a huge uproar about it. There was a massive protest at the school board. Uh, the Idaho Freedom Foundation shared our story as well. We're very happy to report that we worked very hard on that school board. They had to change their policies regarding counselors and propriety so that this kind of a thing wouldn't happen again. That was a big success. It took us about a year. We had to keep, I mean, even in the most conservative areas, it's like the wheels of government just move really slowly. And of course, this was at the height of mask mandates and other outrageous problems that were permeating, you know, what parents were dealing with. So we, just back to what you were saying, Rod, we are well aware of these medical uh, pipelines taking advantage of, you know, school, you know, school uh, staff and paraphernalia, getting to kids, um, grooming them into this transgender nonsense that goes to back, back to also what we did in Ludlow and uh, we're working with a father right now in Canada Rob Hoagland he went to jail because he he opposed what they the school district transitioned his daughter without his knowledge or permission he opposed it the school district and the state got involved they even provided lawyers for the daughter transitioning to a boy and he, and the father had he they ruled against the father says you have to accept it you can't speak out of God's there's a gag order you have to go along with this the father violated the gag order he went to prison for two months just telling the truth about how this school had abused his daughter and turned her into a boy and he is still fighting the the free speech aspect 
there is hope that if there is success in the, he's now going before the Court of Appeals in Canada, and there's a likelihood of success here, and this will establish a precedent that schools cannot abuse the kids like this. So he's put a lot on the line to fight this fight. So we're very well aware of it. We're equipping parents to fight this. We, we go through the city exposing this stuff, getting parents angry enough to come to the school board meetings and just raise hell at the elected officials so they do something about it. Good, good response. Arthur, I've got a couple shotgun questions for you. Maybe we could have quick answers. And then I've got a couple more challenging ones. And if uh, if anybody else has a question uh, during the last 13 minutes here, we'll, we'll do that. But first of all, how come you've dropped the Q? Uh, they brainwashed me so much. I want to say LGBTQ, but why did you guys drop oh. the Q? Well, see, I mean, it's just LGBT. We don't, you know, they're... And they've turned it into like Q, two spirit, intersex, everything. The alphabet. You know, and, and of course, the final letter is P for pedophile, because this has all been, this is at, from beginning to end, it's been about corrupting, abusing, exploiting, molesting minors. I know that's, it bothers a lot of people to hear that, but uh, we've had, uh, we've had activists go underground. Uh, they, they've gone, um, you know, they've uh, they've gone into gay bars incognito. They get testimonies from homosexuals and every single one of them will admit some form of abuse or trauma. Certainly molestation occurred. And that's why they end up into this whole destructive lifestyle. Mm. It's I can't stress how important this is because, you know, in Montana, there's a better audience for this. But even here, it's like you've got I mean, we had all these rhinos that killed a bill to prevent the sex mutilation of minors. This is like a no brainer. And it was just shocking how stupid some of even the leadership was. They bought into these lies that chemical castration um, or, you know, the, 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 the puberty blockers. Oh, they just pause it. But once you get the kids off of it, they get back to normal puberty. No, they don't. They are damaged for life. And thankfully, there's so much noise being made about this. I think that the Montana legislature is going to face a lot of shame if they don't do something about this. I mean, the governor of a governor in Oklahoma openly declared we must ban this horrific practice. And I think Governor Gianforte, I think he does have larger ambitions. At the very least, he needs to show some muscle on this, too. I think he might. That's something we can also pressure him on. Um, but it's like we don't use the cue. We, we're not we're not bullied by their list, but we recognize this is all about taking advantage of at risk youth and even confused adults to bring them into perversion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another quick question. You spoke a lot about the health issues for men involved in these activities. Are there equal amounts of health issues for women? Yes, there are higher incidence of cancers, breast cancers, uh, cervical cancers, the abuse of things that women do to each other with their fists. And this is something that homosexuals tried to suppress in the late 1980s when normalizing their perversion. You know, don't talk about the acts. Don't talk about the behaviors and the consequences. Let's talk about fuzzy things like love and acceptance and civil rights and equality. No, we talk about this stuff. We expose the, the fisting, the rimming, the, the nasty things they do with their mouths to each other. And there is a, this is one of the worst kept secrets among lesbians too, if I didn't mention it, huge, high incidences of domestic violence high women beating up other women it's mm -hmm. very common it's not two loving mothers quote unquote it's a very volatile violent encounter much of the time we'll talk about lesbians i appreciate that okay maybe another quick one for you do you have a place where we can go and find some of these curriculums or the titles of the curriculums that might be teaching these things to our students in schools is there a library somewhere where we can go and say okay i want to cross reference that with what's at my school we we don't have um we, we don't have a specific resource like that. What I can do though, I can share it right now. Uh what we did in Downey, California, we had um uh the, the samples of the curriculum that we got from them. That I was able to take photos of it. We shared it with the public. The full dossier of the sex ed curricula that they were giving to, you know, all level, you know, K through 12, especially to special ed children. That was really disturbing because special ed are, you know, they are, they're a very at risk, vulnerable population. They don't know what's going on. They're very easy to manipulate and they are often targeted for sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So it may not be the specific, specific uh, curricular name, but similar images. These are resources you can take a look at. Teen Talk, that was the name of the general sex ed curriculum. That's the planned parenthood based curricula. Uh, here's some of the information that I, selected from it you know I, I took pages of the curriculum and 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. These are all the groups that they reference: glisten, gay, lesbian, straight. Uh, go back to it really quick. If you if you fast forward, there's actual pictures. I mean, uh, it is explicit. So viewer expression, you know, viewer discretion. But you've heard what I had to say. So it, it, if you go faster, um, some of the stuff you'll see similar kind of content in the sex ed curricula that should alarm you. Let's see. Okay, here we go. So like, you know, explicit pictures of the anatomy. Uh, let's see. Keep uh, keep going. Yeah, so the female anatomy as well. Stop right so there. Much. Yeah, I mean, gender and sexual identities. Now they're telling you about this stuff. Uh, there's one page that talks about scenarios. Like if you're pregnant, if your friend is pregnant, what should you do? And it gives four options. And a lot of like gender queer. I mean, look at this. They're they are they are inducing and seducing these ideas into the kids as if they're normal. That's what this stuff does. And what sex ed generally and what like this homosexual pr promotioning, you know, promotionalism does too is it it gets kids to start experimenting with this stuff. It gets kids to start questioning their identity. This is the general theme of what these core. Here we got. Look at this identity spectrums. I mean, come on now. This, this is the stuff that they're pushing on people. This is the stuff from California. And, uh, you know, one of the um, one of the bills that we also want to we want to introduce is similar to the Florida bill, parents rights and education, you know, no, no discussion of gender identity or other stuff. We want to ban that. Of course, we want to do it for K through 12, not just K through three, which they was what they accomplished in Florida. OK, um, sick to my stomach still. Another question for you is um, what, what is the end game here? Is it is it strictly political or do we have a whole bunch of perverts that want to get away with these acts or is it a combination of both? What is the end game for so much tolerance across our country amongst the elites and the media and everybody? Else? Uh, these are great questions. So this is um you've got like perverted people, you know, who who want to normalize their perversion and want to recruit people into their perversion. That's clear. But here's something else. There is a lot of money. In, in the normalization of perversion. Big business makes big money off of blowing up the family. Uh, when you, broken families, you have broken children become broken adults. They, they want porn, they want food, they want medical, they need drugs. That, you know, just unhealthy, an unhealthy society becomes dependent on the state and becomes dependent on big pharma. There's a lot of money that is involved in the degradation and disillusion of the family. That, that's what's at stake here. And a lot of those interest groups that were listed there in the first few pages of the Team Talk sex ed curricula, these these third party groups, they want to keep the money flowing in as well. And you don't have money flowing in if you're not destroying families and inducing kids into these sick, um, false sexual identities and behaviors. So you've got creepy people, creepy elites. You have a, you know, a satanic cultural Marxist agenda. Um, Linda Gross, or Grossman or... I, her, her first name kind of escapes me right now, but she's someone, uh, she was interviewed briefly on what is a woman. Uh, we've worked with her a number of times. Uh, she points out that you have like very creepy people, uh, you know, Alfred Kinsey, you know, he was a pedophile. He was a pervert. He wanted to normalize his own perversions. And he went to the lengths of trying to academize it. I mean, that's what it is. You've got sick people taking advantage of corrupt human nature to normalize this stuff at length. That's, mm. that's what we're dealing with. And yes, it's very, um, the political thing I should add, um, starting in San Francisco, you know, Willie Brown saw homosexuals as a great political block and it helped him become mayor. This is a great, this is a great political lobby. Homosexuals have lots of money generally because they don't have families and they've got a lot of grievance. So they're relentlessly active. Um, uh, and they're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're like a couple they're about one or two steps removed from suicide bombers. They'll, they're willing to do just about anything to push their perversion because they're so bought up into this false identity and their sense of victimhood. And politicians are afraid of them or want to take advantage of their malevolence for their own gain. Yeah. Well, Rod, why don't you uh, take us to our last question and uh, and then I'll wrap us up. Thanks, Jim. Um, my last question is this. I had looked up a while ago um, the the amount, the percentage of the, the population that considers themselves gay, right? And this was a while ago, but it was like less than 4% of the people. And yet 
every big business, the, like you mentioned, the government, everybody is bowing down. You've got 96% of the population that's normal bowing down and, and kowtowing to 4%. How on earth did, did that and does that happen? You've been so at there, the front lines of this. I, you're the only person I can ask this. Sure. So in 1989, there was a book published called After the Ball by two homosexual activists. And they de it was like the Mein Kampf of the, of the gay movement. And they discussed how they were going to push through media, academia, through major institutions to normalize homosexuals and to portray them as basically just like you and me. They just have a different kind of, um, they just, they love differently. And this is the, this has been the promotion we've seen um, since the late 1980s until now. We, we've seen it saturated in the media. And, and that's why I spent a lot of time dealing with, well, why do I care what two consenting adults do in private? They were born that way. Aren't you being cruel and unusual by going after them and giving them a hard time? A lot of people are not equipped to respond to this. It became very, and, and you had for the, especially in the early 90s, I remember with the, with the HIV outbreak and how George Herbert Walker Bush was routinely assaulted and protested um, by gay activists. There was a large momentum that showed homosexuals as basically benign individuals or the movement as a benign movement. And these are individuals that are victimized. They are born that way. They are just victims of their natural endowments, et cetera. And it's cruel to be opposed to this. And so everybody's been bullied and shamed into it. And then you have corporate America that either you have very creepy people at the top of the corporation that want to roll out and go along with this, or you have cowardly corporations that are afraid of lawsuits. They're afraid of being labeled, canceled, diminished because they won't um, normalize and celebrate these perversions. So they go all in on this. That's that's what we're dealing with. And that's why we are where we are now. People and, it, and it, the fault lies with the general mass of people. We don't understand the importance of family. We don't understand the importance of mom and dad. We weren't able to put forward a clear and strong argument about why family matters, why kids need their mom and their dad. And most importantly, it's been the most pernicious lie that people are born that way. And we have not people have not had adequate research at their fingertips to fight back against that. That's why we talked about, I, I talked about the health hazards of homosexuality. I can also provide that specific study that there's no gay gene, um, but it's, it's the, the, you know, compare it with the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement, they, they faced a similar challenge. People didn't think the baby was a real person. People were foolish enough, you know, if you open up your Bible, it says fearfully and wonderfully made, Right. But if we have to go with science alone, a lot of people didn't know any better. Even Richard Nixon was pro-choice. Most people don't know that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so but the pro-life movement, they made the point that's a human life. It's not a clump of cells. And then they militantly pushed that. And little by little, society became more pervasively aware that it's a human being that we're talking about. It's not just a clump of cells. And it became abhorrent to think of killing that life before it's pregnant, before it's um before it before delivery we need to do the same thing when it comes to what homosexuality is what transgenderism is and how it is essential for kids to have a mom and a dad and destroying marriage hurts kids when we get back to those basics and make that a pervasive part of our argument we put the shame on them you're hurting kids you're full of lies and now you want to hurt me too and i go back to that argument what you do in private is affecting me. This is going to change. This, this is going to require a little bit of a cultural shift because we've had 30 years of libertarianism kind of, well, I do whatever the Bill Clinton mentality. Well, you know, the nineties was a prosperous time. We were all doing well. NASDAQ 5,000 live and let live. It's cool. But here we are in 2022 with the huge cultural rot, hurting our kids, hurting our culture, hurting our country. Yeah. It does matter what you do in private. We can have a say about that now. Mm. Yeah that libertarian temptation and you guys being in the I, I, the Montana, I, the constitution has like a privacy clause in it. I think that can be a point of contention. It's being misconstrued. It's being misused yeah. clearly. Uh, Wyoming has this problem. Uh, Idaho has this problem too. You know, we're, you know, leave us alone, let us fish and hunt and, and we don't want the government in our lives. Well, you know, we need to keep the family unit strong. That, yeah. that requires some effort. Arthur, I, I think that's a great place for us to stop right at that seven o'clock hour. 
Um, I, I could listen to you talk on this subject, you know, a lot more, but it frustrates me even more that I listen to it. So thank you. Thank you for, by the way, early on, you said, you know, you're an organization that's willing to get in people's faces. And I want to thank you for that because that's, that's where I feel I am at this point with people. And it's taken me a while to get there, but uh, I'll be, you guys will obviously I, getting good at this. <laughs> I know you have to wrap up. So I'll go really quick. You know, um, I, there's my phone number. I can make that public 781-474-3005. I get nasty calls too. I don't care. I can handle it. Um, I need everybody to sign up. I need all those legislators to sign up. Jim, please invite everybody. we got to get a nice group of people to go to Helena next year. Um, we need to get, we've got the talking points ready. We just need people. This is so important. And we want to build a mass resistance chapter army in Montana. We want Montana to be a nice pro-family state. You know, a big sky state, big family state. That's what we want. So please sign up, get other people involved. Let's make this happen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for that that final thought because pro-family is what's going to make this country right again. So thanks for tuning into the 1776 Syndicate. We look forward to having you on next week's call. Watch these as often as possible. Please share what we're doing with your friends and family so that we can continue these type of great guests on our show. And, and Arthur, thank you so much. I'll reach out to you tomorrow. We can catch up a little bit. So thank you for your time tonight. Absolutely. One final thing, Jim. Yeah. Uh, next week's call, we do have uh, Sierra Claridge on from the Deliver Fund. Uh, awesome. She actually worked undercover with the Countering Human Trafficking. Um, so <laughs> we're going to have her on. So we've kind of got a, a link going on here with our educational component. And yes. uh, and just and encourage everyone to uh, hop on next week as well. We learn so much and uh, are often more inspired by ordinary people who just get involved than by, you know, the big names. So again, thank you very much, Arthur Shopper. Thanks, Rod. Thank you.